and welcome to Mindful Social Chat, everybody. This week we've got Jed Record, who is very well known We're all over the place. And please go to the website. But uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, Jed, and your company and how you got going in this? Sure. Um, I am a speaker and I speak on topics within marketing and entrepreneurship. Um, and I run a consulting business that interestingly enough advises firms on content marketing strategies among other things. Um, so I have a company called like force, which, uh, I hire college students and teach them how to, uh, provide content marketing, uh, for small businesses in the communities where they go to school and they use that to earn income while they're in college and to get some great experience um, for when they graduate and aspire to a career in marketing or PR or communications. Oh, um, you might have muted and forgot to unmute, Janet. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> That's such a great idea because it's really a win-win for everybody, right? That you know, the students get a little bit of extra income and they earn a skill and it's a great way for employees to, uh, to connect too. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of made sense when, when I looked into it about a year ago and we gave it a whirl and it is really helping the students as well as the businesses, uh, that they're working with. Um, it is kind of a, uh, community thing for me. It's, it's, it's how I give back yet. It's still a for-profit company. It's not how I make a living, but it's doing well. And, um, and I love the ability to, uh, kind of provide value on all sides of the equation there. That's great. So today we're talking about paid social. And I think really this comes from a conversation about, how a lot of brands are really not doing paid social very smartly. And that's, you know, it's really easy for brands to think that all they have to do is pay bloggers to share information about them and everything's going to be great and everybody's going to love them, but that's kind of bullshit. So let's talk about how we could really be doing that right. Uh, well, you're not going to pull any punches on this one, Janet. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so I think there are a lot of brands doing well, and I think there are a lot of brands that um, uh, are, are still testing the waters here, trying to figure out um, how to distribute their branded content in a way that's, that's smart for them. Um, there's also a large push out there to continue growing communities. So we're starting to look at audiences more as communities rather than just uh, our target demographic. And I really like, um, I really like hearing a lot. Uh, I really like hearing that a lot. Um, so in some of the CMOs that I've been talking to over the last six months, um, they uh, expressed to me um, interest on how to turn their audiences on, on social media and um, those uh, people that they reach through both paid and organic uh, content and how to create communities from those audiences. So let's <laughs> talk about Excuse what me. kind of um, strategies that they can use. I mean, a lot of brands want us to just put out their specific message, but really if you're going to do paid social, you might want to customize that a little bit. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, again, um, one of the uh, one of the things I try to, to force companies to do before they go out and, and make any paid purchases or even try and develop um, uh, communities on on social or digital platforms is to understand the goals that they're driving towards. Um, what good does a community bring to them? Like, how does a, having a community benefit them? And so a, a lot of these firms are, are looking to increase the, um, the loyalty um, and, and top of mind with uh, consumers. 
And in B2B, um, really trying to focus on um, really delighting and, um, and, and creating ongoing relationships with customers. So they want the community to be a resource for their customers to continue to have um, good conversations, positive conversations with the brand, um, but to also be a place where uh, delighted customers can uh, bring their peers and friends to expose them to, to a relationship with this company as well. Um, mm. So with that, um, we're looking to, to kind of set some goals for paid content versus, um, you know, having your own content, uh, which we know is primarily, you know, the content that exists on your website um, or on specific social platforms that are branded to your brand. Um, we also delve into this earned media opportunity, which is um, I really push hard, particularly for community building, to do like user generated content campaigns um, and other interactive type campaigns that bring um, audience members into the community and feel like they're participating. Um, and there's also this um, earned type of content that is um, influencer or um, or third party driven. So you'll have influencers or or area experts writing content um, about your products and services. And that's that's this earned media piece. And that actually will slip into what we'll talk about today, which is paid. So we're talking about why are we going to put down money on the table if we're already spending effort and time developing our content and, and spreading it across social media platforms, which uh, clients are quick to remind me uh, costs nothing. It's free, right? I thought social media was free. Isn't all social media free? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I, I believe everybody in the audience knows, obviously, that, that Distributing content on social media is not free. It takes time to create great content. It takes time to get that content out uh, onto the platforms. And it takes people to be out there engaging with customers to have this content to be meaningful to the customer. And that on really explains... Of... Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I want to hear what you had to say. That really explains why people should be paying for media. And I think that's one of the things that you know, people don't understand, brands don't understand the whole idea of social media is always free, isn't it? So why are we paying these people? And if we pay them, why don't they say exactly what we want them to say? So, you know, I think that's really a challenge for for brands, whether it's B2B or B2C, to understand how that system can work. Um, yeah, so, so paying influencers, I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but paying them um, and then telling what content to put out is kind of pointless because the reason that you're hiring influencers is for them to create these authentic relationships, um, to build the trust um, factor with your audience. And by paying for them to be your megaphone and just share your branded content um, really isn't going to carry any of that trust and isn't going to build any of that um, participation and trust that you're looking for. Um, but paid paid influencers is only a tiny piece of the spectrum when we're talking about paid media. So let me start by giving a quick overview of what I mean yes. when I'm talking about uh, paid media. Um, probably the largest spend on paid media that we'll see companies making is in paid search. Um, and that makes sense. You want to be discoverable, right? So um, a, a lot of what I do is outside the search realm, but I do want to acknowledge that that's going to be where a, a large bulk of the spending will be for that. Um, another large area of spending for, for larger brands is on video ads because they tend to be expensive, but they're, they can also be quite successful. Um, I'm happy to advise firms on that as well, but typically we go to agencies to actually execute on, on that video content. Um, and then, you know, the core of, of what I help companies with is basically 
getting their branded content in front of the right customer at the right time. And that's what the paid piece is all about. And there's a lot of channels that you can do that and a lot of ways you can do that. You can use, you know, display is still a, a very prominent um, type of advertising online and, and successful as well, particularly on mobile. Um, and, and then you can also talk about other opportunities like um, uh, just paying to boost your branded content to the right audiences. So targeted advertising is is a very successful uh, strategy as well. And then uh, there's sometimes when even sponsorships uh, work out. So if you, you're sponsoring a podcast or or uh, sponsoring an event, uh, those things can also be quite successful at getting your branded content out. Display meaning banners. Yes, believe it or not, display meaning banners, uh, but there's lots of other types of display ads too, Gail. But um, the banner, banner, AKA display ads, still uh, we're seeing uh, pretty high um, rates of success and success metrics are determined a little bit differently. Uh, a lot of the brands I work with, um, they're not online. They're not doing uh, online stores, so online selling. So we're not talking click through to a sale, but we talk about click through to a conversion, like downloading downloading a piece of content or uh, some other way where we can get some contact information and and start getting. Uh, a little bit deeper relationship with these customers. Um, particularly on mobile, we're seeing display ads performing quite well. Um, so uh, I would so suggest that people keep that in mind. On mobile for display ads, are we talking about Instagram and Facebook ads in particular, or are you talking about Google search ads, which I think are, are really quite different animals? Yeah, so I'm not going to dis- I, I don't want us to get into to search. That's I think that's a whole different mm-hmm. conversation for a whole different audience. Um, so I'm talking for display, and that could be within that could be in app display. So that could be mm-hmm. in Facebook, in you know Twitter, but in app display ads work across all ad- like lots of successful platforms and apps for in app display ads. Um, games are particularly successful in terms of um, getting getting good brand awareness numbers, particularly if there's some relevancy that you can drive to the game or the target target audience you know is, is specific to a particular game. Um, and and there are other apps as well. Travel apps are great for travel display ads. So. Um, it depends on what the niche is and what the content is that you're trying to get out there. So I would look to and keep an eye open for in-app display ads, mobile specific ads, uh, mm-hmm. content developed specifically for mobile. Um, all of these things are, are doing quite well in terms of display ads. But again, advertising in, dis- in the display form is just one piece of the puzzle for paid. So mm-hmm. we've talked about paid search and we just mentioned paid display ads. Um, and I brushed over video, we'll, we'll loop around back to that if, if we have time at the end. Um, but I think the biggest piece that we look to, particularly with building communities, is utilizing these social networks and these social native ads. And by native, I mean they, they appear in line in the content uh, of the ad. You, you, I'm sure you're familiar with seeing it within your Facebook stream, a post that is actually an ad, but it comes right, right. in, looks like the other post. Mm-hmm. That native um, content uh, is, is a great opportunity to build brand awareness, to, um, to do retargeting and remarketing uh, to folks, um, all kinds of opportunities there to, to really get your con- your branded content out in front of the customer. Yeah, I think I think the inline or the native ads are definitely the most effective. In fact, Google has just kind of taken off their whole right side column, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if Facebook did too at some point. Except that theirs tend to be more visual. Um, I think it's a little harder on networks like Twitter, for example, um, 
you know, to really get things in front of people and keep it sticking. And I think that's one of the things that brands challenge are challenged with is getting that kind of stickiness with their content. Um, well, yeah, I think with, with Twitter, we can certainly get um, Twitter cards and Twitter content, paid Twitter content in front of eyeballs and target them to some degree, not as, not as well as Facebook, but still pretty targeted ads. Um, I think it's the action rate. So the rate at which the um, person who's exposed to that piece of content actually takes action on it. That, that is the, the, the little more difficult piece to it. And then we're still um, with several of my clients studying um, the exposure rate. So if you're exposed to, um, let's say, a, a, a tweet about Coke or, or a tweet about Pepsi, um, does that affect the top of mind awareness for that particular brand hours later? So we're still looking into that to seeing what that kind of brand awareness type advertising can do for a company. Um, and traditional marketers are quite hopeful for that because they've done similar studies uh, in, in, in print, they've done similar studies in out of home, um, and it's it's been quite successful to give these repetitive ads over time to increase brand awareness and top of mind. So. Um, I'm not sure. I don't have the bottom line on that. Um, the numbers I've seen coming from Twitter ads, clients I've worked with, um, they're a little bit pricey for what you get. And with Facebook, it's a little cheaper and you can target it even that much more finely. Um, so Facebook would be my first area of preference for that. But I'm not going to rule Twitter out uh, all the way. Well, it depends um, on the brands. Too, obviously. Um, I think the ads that I click on the most on Instagram are app installs. They kind of know that I'm totally willing to <laughs> click on another app that's going to edit photos or, or whatever that is. So I think one of the things that we can say about brands that do this right are actually taking a mindful approach to their audience and understanding who they are and what they might want um, rather than just thinking about what they want to sell. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, think, I think app installs is a good example. I think it's also something that marketers should take note of that um, we're getting to the point where um, companies are going to be releasing their own apps as a platform to get their content in, in front of people. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to start seeing, uh, and, and we already see it now with, with apps coming out, specifically for brands. Um, I've seen some some failed apps and, and some successful apps um, from brands, but um, we're going to see a lot more of it. And it's going to be a content platform that they're going to be using to, to you know, provide enough value to get you to download the app so that they can now continue this relationship, uh, you know, in a, a much more uh, enclosed area so they don't have to buy all this um, this placement and targeting uh, stuff on, on social networks. But um, backing it up a little bit, you know, let's talk about some strategies that, that we see out there being used for paid content out there to give some real world examples to people. Uh, because I'm, hope, I'm hopeful that folks watching this will be able to pick up some techniques uh, and some tactics to go back and use in their office or give it a try tomorrow and see if this is helpful for them. Um, and so one of the things that um, I try and do when we're looking at a, an audience um, is we always wanna see how we're gonna expand the audience. So, that, so the two things that I'm looking to get out of paid um, kind of in phase one is to increase our brand reach, to expand all the new people that we can contact um, using paid uh, promotion of content and to increase and amplify existing successful content. Um, so I'm looking for uh, expanding reach and for amplifying what's already working. And so one of the ways that we can expand our reach or discoverability um, is by 
paying to distribute top of funnel content, which is this early level awareness content, um, introducing people to your company and to the problems that your company solves and expanding that beyond your, your core audience. So you use paid to, to get out outside of your target base. So w- what do I mean by that? So let's take your Facebook page, for example. Um, if you want to introduce companies to you, people to your content through Facebook um, and you want to introduce new people so that's not existing fans. You need to then pay for your content to be seen by people other than people who have already liked your page, right? So these are people who might meet some demographic criteria, but haven't been to your website, haven't been to your Facebook page, or haven't liked your Facebook page. And you can do that using uh, paid content promotion on Facebook. Um, another way that you might do that is... Um, that you'll look for I think Jed locked up there for a second Uh, let's jump in until he comes back and if anybody has any questions please type them in the chat just type slash Q and then your question in the chat oh great Craig found Red, Red Bull's uh, content app, that's been seen. which, you know, I totally agree. They have amazing content. And for companies like that that can really create a ton of content and keep it rolling and keep it rolling, they have a perfect opportunity for an app that we'll actually go to and dedicate our time to. Uh, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I have a lot of news apps on my phone and I get a lot of different types of news, whether it's local news or international news or business related news through the apps on my phone. And at some point, you know, I'll I'll go to the push notifications for the ones that I really like and I'll follow them on social and I'll share those. And in that way, they're kind of earning my trust by being a great resource for me and a great resource for content. And I think that's true with Red Bull too. They have really great entertaining content. Here's Jed coming back in. And, you know, so they take that content and get people to share it for them. And it it can be really a huge way to get a lot of of organic shares. We were just talking about Red Bull before you came back, Jed. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened there. Uh, Blab just said goodbye to me. It's the internet. We never know what it's going to (laughs) do. Yeah, we'll give it another shot. Um, so I mentioned um, paying to uh, to boost or expand the reach of successful organic content. Did I cover that? Yeah, you were just kind of getting into the middle of okay. that. Okay. <laughs> so that's pretty much a no-brainer, right? So you're seeing within your community that uh, people are responding to, to a specific message and engaging with specific content. Uh, that's the content that you want to attract new members to your community. So you need to pay to expand your reach there. I would even pluck that content out of its context. Um, so, so if it's doing well on Facebook, I would say, okay, let's use that same content and start putting it on Instagram and putting it on Twitter and seeing what we see there and exposing it to new audiences there and see if it still has that engagement. Not getting um, locked up on one platform. Yeah, exactly. Um, you're 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 touching a nerve somewhere. You're touching on a message that people are uh, able to relate to, and, and you want to um, spread that to to more and more places to see if you can attract. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm thinking Jet's got a bandwidth issue. Let's see if he uh, can make that work or not. So I think, I think he's making a really great point here about how, you know, when we've got really great content and it's working, I mean, not all the time. Sometimes we have what we think is really great content and it's actually us talking to ourselves. But when we start people. considering what the network that we're trying to approach is interested in and what floats their boat, 
then we know that we've got kind of a baseline that our market's interested in what we're doing. And then we can take a look at how we can use that on other networks. It's really common with content creators to only put out content on one platform because it's working there, but it may or may not work on other platforms. You may need to repurpose it. You may need to reposition how you're making your case. There's lots of ways that you know you can make that work differently on different content platforms. And you have to be considerate about how that platform works, how people speak to each other on that platform. We all know that LinkedIn is very different from Facebook and Instagram. Certainly Snapchat is very different. So figuring out how you can take that messaging that's working for people and then taking it across platforms. Um, you know, there's also, there's a comment here from uh, David and he says, but in reality, if those people aren't seeking out your content via search, not being introduced it, to it via social, what's the likelihood your promoted content is really something they want to see? And that's a really great point that, you know, if you're paying for somebody to uh, see your content and it's not striking the right mark, then maybe that's not going to work for you. And then you may want to move to a different network and take that paid promotion and use it as an example for kind of as, as a test. If I do a paid promotion on this platform, is that going to work? And if it does work, then how can we use it on other platforms? There's, there's Jed back. Yay. <laughs> I'm just babbling on in your absence. Oh, now I can't hear you. Nope. It's always so much more fun on Blab. Still can't hear you. And David says, isn't that like throwing spaghetti against the wall? And yeah, you bet it is. You throw spaghetti against the wall and you hope that it's going to work. Um, if it doesn't work, then you try different spaghetti. But it hopefully is a little more planned and a little more thought out than that, that we're actually thinking about what the market wants, doing our research, doing our homework, finding out what's working and then using that information to try it again. And we're going to try and get Jed in here again. <laughs> there he is. How about now? Hello. We can hear him. Yay. <laughs> Okay, so I tried switching to my phone, um, but I'm back on my PC now, so I don't know what's okay. wrong with the internet connection here. You just never know. So <laughs> we were talking while you were gone about, you know, is throwing paid promotion out there on multiple platforms kind of like throwing spaghetti on the wall and seeing if it's working? And, and oh, let's talk a little so bit more about that strategy. Let's talk about that. So absolutely right. It is like throwing spaghetti against the wall unless you're seeing real engagement with your core audience members on other platforms with that same content. Mm -hmm. Now you've actually gotten some specific results that you can go and test on other platforms. So I would say no, if you're taking high performing content from one platform and bringing it to another, you're actually you're actually taking some evidence based successful content and now testing it on these other platforms to to see if that draws in uh, new customers, new engaged audience members on those platforms. So yes, I would say it if you're just randomly doing that, but we're doing it with the high high performing content and we've had success doing that. Right. And and like Sunday says, that's why the data is so important. And a lot of times we don't think about the data. We think about our messaging and we want to get it out there. And it's so important to get it out there the way we want it. That may not be what works for the network. So can we switch gears a little bit to talking about working with influencers or working with earned content? Once we get our messaging out there and we know that the, that paid promotion is working and that people are liking the content, they're engaging with it, they're sharing it, how do we get from there to having more earned content than paid content or at least so, making that shift? 
So this the same holds true for uh, influence influencers and and earn content. So if we are uh, if we've got a program inviting influencers to participate um, in either sharing uh, images or content or just uh, sharing opinions, their opinions on on our products or services, and we believe that that influencer content is going to be productive for us, we'll go and pay to boost those influencer pieces. So mm -hmm. if an influencer posts on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter uh, a message that we think is going to resonate with our target audience, we'll go in there and pay to boost that Facebook post or pay to boost that, that tweet um, and get that amplified out to a much broader audience, even if it's an influencer with a large audience, we'll, we'll pay to even boost it beyond their audience um, mm -hmm. because our audience may have a crossover, but we want to spread that influencer content uh, and that earned content uh, to as many uh, eyes and ears as possible. So pay does play a role in there too, to really amplify those efforts. That's a great point. I think a lot of people don't realize the value of spending a little bit of money on somebody else's content that supports your general mission. I think so. A lot of people in here may know a friend of mine, his name's uh, Brian Fanzo, and he will do um, influencer contact content for a company. And, and he's a really uh, animated guy with a strong opinion. And, yes, he um, and if his message resonates, it really carries through his community. Mm -hmm. um, but his community is relatively small compared to other influencers of, uh, of, of similar recognition. So you look at a guy like Joel Com, who's got 200,000 followers on Twitter, um, Fanzo's audience of 50,000 seems kind of small. Um, so what you would do is amplify his content that he's, um, producing for your brand and pay to spread that beyond the 50,000 uh, followers that he might have on Twitter to get that exposure to hundreds of thousands of people because you know his message is catchy. You know his message has the opportunity to be to be viral among your, your audience. So you want mm -hmm. to expand that um, as far as you can. At the same time, though, I agree with David that you know, and, and it's hard to use Joel Common and, and Brian Fanzo as comparisons because, you know, Joel has a huge network, but it's very engaged. But if we look at somebody who has 100,000 followers and they're not engaged, Brian Fanzo's followers are, are rabidly engaged. So, so I, I guess that makes my point, there. right? So the, the fact that um, Brian can reach this highly engaged audience um, by paying to boost that content to get it beyond um, his core audience and, and expand. Um, not only does it help Brian, so it's a good partnership to work with Brian, but it mm -hmm. also, and this is just as an example, right? Just taking uh, an influencer with a small niche audience, but has got a message that reaches your target customer base, which should be much larger than their niche audience. Mm -hmm. um, and get that to expand beyond that audience and to expose yeah. more people to that message. I think that I think that and in this case, it's it's not exactly the same, but I think that people confuse numbers with value. You know, if somebody has a small niche and they're very focused in it, having access to that niche and and getting them to support you can actually get you more engagement from the users than somebody who's got a really broad niche and they don't have that level of engagement. Um, you know, I, I think, think we're saying the same thing. Um, so much. I think we're, <laughs> so you want, you want to target uh, that influencer that, that has the message and the, and the excited audience th that, mm -hmm. that is there to be receptive to that person's message. Uh, I'm just saying uh, don't settle just for that audience. Take that, take that message and that excited audience and then grow it just you can use paid content to boost that message outside mm -hmm. of that core audience i'm not saying you want to get outside the audience because that's not what you want you 
I'm already saying we've already paid for that audience by doing this influencer relationship, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm looking at it now from the standpoint of, okay, we've we've already paid for this sponsor or, or influencer um, message and influencer audience. Now, how can we best take advantage of that? Well, let's get that excitement spread beyond just the engagement that it will see within that core audience. So right. if we so see... If we see Fanzo doing um, doing a live stream or doing a video that's getting all kinds of comments and activity and reshares, um, why limit that just to the core audience um, that he's exposed to? Why not bring more and more people to see that activity and, and just by exposing them to that activity invites them to join in on that conversation? So part of the difference is, is that in using the paid, you can actually target people that will be interested in the content instead of just broadcasting it all over the place. That Absolutely. was the not yet. Okay. Make. So not spaghetti <laughs> against the wall, right? Yeah. You want to pay to boost it to like-minded individuals within, within that group. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to yeah. pay to just show it to, to grandmothers and teenagers. You, you want to, you want to, get people who are within that target demographic. And that's why social media is such a wonderful tool for that because we can really target it down well. Mm. Um, look like audiences are perfect for that. So if you do a look like audience um, on, on, your in, on your influencers audience, so you say, I want to look like audience that resembles everybody who likes the Brian Fanzo fan page. Um, Boom, but but doesn't already like the Brian Fanzo fan page, right? So you're getting mm -hmm. a look alike, but they're not already in that group. Right. That's per like that's that's the perfect. Why would you pass that up? <laughs> I would spend uh, a lot of dollars to expose a uh, Brian Fanzo look alike audience to Brian Fanzo content. Mm -hmm. So and let's talk I, about that. I don't mean to pull him out of a hat. I just. <laughs> No, but he's a great example. He's somebody I think we mutually know, and uh, it's a great example because he's got this really vibrant community surrounding him, but it's relatively small on the scale of things. So for for brands and companies that want to reach huge markets, uh, this is the tactic I would use. So let's just for people who don't know what a lookalike audience is, can you give us a little synopsis of what what that is? Sure. Um, so on Facebook, when you're running ads on Facebook, um, you can be real specific about the types of audiences you're targeting. And one of the tools that Facebook offers you is the option to build a lookalike audience. And evidently within the Facebook ads team, they have a algorithm that takes a list of Facebook users and can generate a comparable list uh, of other Facebook users that share a number of, uh, of demographic points or activity points um, that are very similar. So if you give them, for instance, you can upload a mailing list. So if you have a mailing list of uh, 10,000 people, you upload that mailing list and now you can say, okay, Facebook, I want to run a campaign that exposes my top performing content to a lookalike audience that looks like my mailing list. I mean, why people don't do this more often, I have no idea, but basically you upload your mailing list. It searches Facebook for those email addresses. If they're registered at Facebook, they can take those user IDs and see, oh, they've liked this page and that page and that page. They've engaged with this type of content and that type of content and their algorithm will go and say, okay, um, here are X number of users on Facebook who also have liked this page, this page, and this page and have engaged on these types of posts. Um, so it's a really, really powerful tool. Um, Lookalike audiences is what it's called. You can search, uh, John Loomer has a great uh, couple of blog posts about lookalike audiences. I think um, uh, before, we're, before we're through, I'll send you a, a link to another resource uh, on YouTube that talks about lookalike audiences. But if you, if you type lookalike audiences on Facebook into Google or YouTube, you'll find some great uh, articles on how to use those.
Yeah, and it is it is a hugely powerful way to connect with both, you know, people that are similar to your existing audience. If you have a small newsletter list, that's okay. You can still use that and expand it. And then if you combine that with lead ads, which is a new type of ad on Facebook, I'm sure you know about this, Chad, that uh, lead ads can actually convert people to your to subscribe to your newsletter right there in Facebook. It, it pulls in their name, it pulls in their email. You can ask them a couple of questions and it's a really great way to add to your newsletter list really quickly. We've had great success with lead ads. So absolutely a great, another great opportunity. Um, basically it, it prevents people from having to leave Facebook to go sign up for whatever it is you're trying to get them to sign up for. So you can use it for a content download or for a list sign up and they stay right within Facebook and Facebook actually um, plugs in the email address that you registered for Facebook with. So the user doesn't even actually have to type anything. Their name and their email address is plugged right in. And they say, do you want to share this with the advertiser? If they click yes, then boom, you're added to their list and they go back to their Facebook feed. So pretty, pretty smooth operation there uh, on Facebook's part. And they don't lose that, um, person away from the Facebook stream. They keep them on Facebook. So it's a win-win for both the advertiser and, and for Facebook. Yeah, exactly. It's Facebook did it to keep us from going off, wandering off onto somebody's website and signing up, but it really helps us lose that attrition that, you know, people go, I don't really want to leave Facebook or they leave Facebook, they get to your page. Maybe your newsletter form isn't right there where they can get it and they get lost. So that, that kind of attrition doesn't happen with this. And lookalikes are a great way to, to build that list really quickly. Um, you know, I, there's all different kinds of targeting. The targeting on these sites now is just amazing, really. Um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty incredible and, and, and um, really powerful for even the smallest of, of marketers, so smallest of companies that, that want to use this tool. So uh definitely worth taking a look into uh, i want to mention before we move off this topic um that in, along these same veins i've talked about taking content you know that works in your community and then spreading it out to similar audiences outside of your community well a lot of people miss the opportunity to find those high converting uh, we talked about google search and running search ads um, those high converting search ads or high converting click-through sales ads. So if you're a retail, online, re online retailer, take your highest converting sales ads or highest converting click-through ads and then create content around those and share them within your existing community. And mm -hmm. you can really balloon some sales if you see that your, your top converting sales ads are doing really well they're not actually getting exposed organically to your audiences. And what you can do then is take those ads, convert them into content and have that content be a call to action to convert them to a sale and then boost that content instead of externally to non-audience members, boost it to everybody who's liked your page or boost it to everybody mm -hmm. who's been to your website. Um, and that is a way to really double down on some content that you know is working and converting for you. Um, and it's really important that you accelerate what's working and you find out quickly uh, what's not working and, and back off the pedal. And, and these are a number of tactics that enable you to do that. That's a really great point because, you know, a lot of times people think they have to create the content before they create the ads. And, you know, they, they, they're thinking in that mode, but you can actually use these ads as a way to test different, different strategies for your content development and say, okay, yeah, they're really going for this. Let's talk more about that. Let's build some more content around that. I love that idea. That's really smart. Um, well, thank you. Uh, it, <laughs> You're welcome. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just the, you know, taking common sense and and thinking through a lot of these things and then just making a plan out of it so you don't forget once you start executing on your campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that I never did when I was doing the marketing style of let's wing it. 
because <laughs> that was a marketing style I had for many years. Mm -hmm. um, and once you formalize some of these processes and, and get them down on paper and create a marketing plan that's, that's written and well thought out and planned, then these types of tactics don't get overlooked and they're built into your strategy. So, um, it reminds you that, uh, we're, we're here to take advantage of those opportunities that we find. And, um, we don't want to coast when we see that our content's performing great and sit back and give each other high fives. That's when we want to really focus on, okay, how can we now we've, we've found something that's working. How can we really take, take advantage of this? Mm -hmm. So let's go into the data a little bit more then as far as analyzing what's working and what's not working. Um, you know, what are some of the, the common metrics that people use and what kind of tools are people using to measure those metrics? All right. So this is where things get tricky. Uh, many of the firms that I work with uh, have resources to manage the analytics for this um, in an integrated way, which I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have those resources, you need to put together a way that you can kind of automate the uh, reporting on, on some of these statistics so that you can come back to the data and put it out in a way that's going to make sense, give you the high big picture view. And things that you want to keep in mind when you're, when you're doing this is you need to, you need to have separate data columns for both your paid content and your organic or unpaid content. Mm -hmm. And then you have to be able to find a way to report on both of them added together, right? So Facebook does this for us, which is pretty nice um, in the Facebook console, but we need to do this on other platforms as well. Yeah. Um, so that you can see the impact that your paid is having on your, on your organic content. Um, so, Tools you'll use for that, obviously the Facebook console, that's very helpful. Um, you can configure, um, you can configure Google Analytics to track those. And what you'll have to do is you'll have to use these UTM IDs. Are you familiar with that? We're I'm getting not. a little wonky. Okay, we're getting a little wonky now when we start talking about analytics. It's okay, uh, go for can, it. What you can do is you can configure your links in your content to contain key sequences that are called mm -hmm. UTMs or UTM um, codes. Okay. Uh, they're, they're markers. I think that stands for some kind of universal marker or something, I don't know. If somebody in the lab wants to type in the comments what UTM stands for, uh, that'd be helpful. I'm sure <laughs> Dave knows. Um, but basically it gives Google Analytics a way to keep these links separate so that you know, and, and he, in his, in his uh, comment there, uh, David says that they come in uh, for uh, separate channels. Um, so when you put a specific UTM key for links that are, you're sharing on Facebook or links that you're sharing on blog posts and separate ones on links that you're sharing on Twitter or for a different campaign, you can see these links in different types of views on Google Analytics and you can sort them for the specific campaigns. The UTMs are, are very... Those are the really long... Like, yeah, they're, they're very, there's like four or five different attributes to them. So you can have campaign specific IDs, you can have platform specific IDs. Um, there you go, see, he, he knows all this. So Dave says UTM stuff. equals urchin tracking mode okay. because urchin was the early analytics program. All right. Thank you, so, Dave. Uh, years ago, Google bought Urchin, which was a uh, statistics and reporting package for, for websites, and mm -hmm. that's become Google Analytics. Um, and um, so you'll use these key identifiers, or, which I call UTMs, and um, they contain information on, um, on the platform you're using, on the campaigns that, the, that are taking place, um, and you can group them even finer, finer than that. Um, and then on your reports, you can see if this campaign was paid, uh, if it was unpaid, you can see where the links were coming from. So if they're coming from Facebook or Twitter or, or your blog, um, and it enables you to get a big picture view 
of how paid content is impacting your overall content marketing strategy. And that's mm -hmm. the big thing that you need to have this over this hierarchy, this overarching view of how paid is impacting your content marketing strategy. So you can justify your budget at the end of the quarter. So that like an important point, key, right? So you're not <laughs> going to get the budget to do this paid work without being able to report it. And mm -hmm. so that's what you want to, that's what your goal is when you're reporting on the metrics. Well, and one thing to note too, is that with, if you don't do custom link codes like that, you're not going to see all of the traffic because I believe, and Dave, correct me if I'm wrong or Jed, um, mobile is shows up a lot differently. If somebody clicks on Facebook uh, and they're using mobile, it may show up as direct in your Google analytics unless you're using some kind of UTM codes in your links or bit.ly links, um, something that's going to kind of qualify those. I still think that there's a lot of misreporting in Google Analytics as far as social links go. Yeah, and it's not just mobile. It's it's even even um, direct even links that are that are on desktop coming from mm -hmm. social media oftentimes are misconstrued as misconstrued as direct links mm -hmm. uh, when they're actually referrals. And any links, I think, coming from um, secure websites like HTTPS websites, which is a lot now, more and more companies are going to HTTP, HTTPS, mm -hmm. um, it's more and more difficult to, to get referring information from secure sites because they don't pass on a refer um, that, right. that can be tagged. Um, and so if you'll notice next time you're on LinkedIn or, or uh, Twitter, they're, they're using HTTPS. So um so yeah so it's very important to be able to figure out how to do that unfortunately that's that's not my skill set so fortunately i can rely <laughs> on the uh, analytics folks i have a general understanding of how it works um and what i try and advise them to do is uh create reports in a way so that you can compare um organic versus paid and how the paid impacted your your organic content um, so you'll need to be able to have separate reports for paid, a separate report for organic, and then a combined report that shows the result of both in order to do that. So um, what other tools might you recommend as far as whether it's at managing your paid media or measuring those metrics? Are there any specific tools that you really prefer to use? Um, well, there's uh, a lot of different platforms out there um, specifically to measure social um, campaigns, mm -hmm. uh, campaigns on social. I think Zoom is a, is a good one. Um, and I know it's built in to some programs like um, uh, Radiant 6, which is kind of an enterprise deal. Uh, I'm not sure what Sprout Social offers there, but I'm sure the reporting is pretty good. The reporting is um, really great. Every client that I've worked with has had a different type of, of way to, to report these types of analytics. So, mm. um, and I haven't come across a platform that does um, exactly what, what I think would be the best way to do it. It's probably because it's technically nearly impossible, but... Uh, uh, Google Analytics, for the most part, can can do a good job of it. Um, it, it just depends on um, how the company is is keeping their website analytics. If, if they're using Google Analytics for their website, then Google Analytics might be the right package to do it. Um, if they're using some uh, custom uh, web management software, um, then that software may or may not be a, a tool that they could use. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have specific tool recommendations for analytic packages. I am sure. going to go look into that because that, I think that's <laughs> a great question. And unfortunately, it's one right now I, I don't have a great answer to. Hmm. Well, I, I found Google Analytics to kind of be lacking a little bit for us. Um, and AI, we have the same challenge you do is that with every client we work with, they already have the package that they're working with. And so, you know, we'll tend to work within that. Um, you know, we use Sprout Social for analytics a lot, which is really great. We use some different hashtag, hashtag tracking tools as well. 
Um, but for the web standpoint, I, I'm really starting to like Hotjar because they will do, they'll do heat maps on your website, but they'll also, you can walk through the funnels as to how people are getting there. And it's, it's pretty powerful too. Yeah. Um, I've seen, I've seen the hot jar in action. Um, I think it's pretty cool, but I, I haven't seen it on, on a large scale hmm. implemented in a large scale. So I'm not sure. Um, um, I'm not sure how that would work in, in a larger enterprise, but certainly for small, medium business, I think hot jar is a viable uh, option for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Dave, you've probably got some suggestions there as well, or are you totally into analytics? You'll have to let us know in the chat. Um, I think, you know, these tools are always evolving and we're always looking for that perfect dashboard that's going to do everything. And they just, don't exist. I mean, you know, we, we keep trying to find them, but since every platform's changing and all the analytics are changing, it can be really, really challenging to find something that's going to do everything for everybody. Um, Simply Measured is a good one too. Sunday mentions that. Um, I like their analytics for social, but it doesn't necessarily track all of our paid stuff um, that we want to get in there too. Yeah. Um, I I would just uh, say same here on that one. There you go. I, I like it for for organic social, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that's about that's about as far as we can take it. Yeah, that's always the challenge. Well, Jed, it doesn't I wanna... have to. It doesn't have to be overly comprehensive either. We get a little bit scared about you know the the analytics side. Um, it, it doesn't need to be super overdone, and and I feel like a lot of these companies kind of overdo it and make it configurable so that you can have any number of millions of com uh, of combinations of analytics when really I, I think it's sufficient um, to, to just stick to, to four different types of metrics um, that my friend Jay Baer mentions um, tracking for content. So for content marketing, we try and kind of keep it to uh, consumption metrics. That's, that's who's consuming our content sharing metrics which is a big one that we look for is how is our content getting shared and, and which content is is being shared more than others uh lead generation metrics so that is uh who's clicking through for online retailers this would be conversion metrics mm -hmm. um and um and then the sales funnel metrics so this is um if if you can this is the hardest one to track right so um, if there is a, a platform out there that enables you to um, track when people are consuming your content, sharing it out, then clicking through and converting on one of these downloadable um, uh, download gates, right, so that you can get their contact info, and then later matching that up with something in Salesforce or, or somewhere um, in some sort of sales package, that's like the holy grail. Mm -hmm. um, we typically, Definitely. yeah, we talk, we typically see the biggest problem in connecting that sales metrics piece to the other three. Um, but I'm I'm happy to see consumption, sharing, and lead gen metrics, um, and then somehow um, connecting as best we can with the with the sales function. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we'll still keep chasing the holy grail, most likely. <laughs> So uh, before we close out, Janet, I do want to uh, mention two recommendations Great. that um, I've been sharing with clients that I've been getting kind of uh, open eye looks like, oh, we should be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and so I think that'd be useful for your audience. Great. Um, the, the first big one is when when dealing with paid is to create an integrated content calendar that includes your paid promotion calendar. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what we'll do is, is we'll um, put the content calendar on whatever calendaring tool you're using, and then we'll create also a paid promotion calendar. And typically what we see is the people doing the paid promotion are different from the people doing the content calendars. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we'll do is we'll share those calendars with each team's so that the people have the option of clicking on a combined view. And it's the combined view that we use for planning, um, 
for looking back at the previous month and seeing how well we did. Um, and we'll use that combined view calendar um, to really s measure our success. We'll hopefully, hopefully we'll have some good metrics we can look at, look at the combined view calendar from the previous month and look forward to the next month and say, hey, are we lining these up correctly? Um, are we releasing content when it makes sense and when we're planning to pay that pay for for amplifying some content and mm -hmm. you can't always know ahead of time but at least having those the ability to share those and overlay those two calendars is really important um, number two is um, have people on staff have somebody doing what we call social listening um, and it doesn't have to be all consuming um, you can have a person take a por percentage of their time each week and just check in on content that's out there on your networks already and be mm -hmm. listening to get ready and, and be ready to amplify content that's really starting to get engagement. What you want to do is look for that engaging content that's getting a lot of interaction and go and pay to expand that content. And, and like we talked about earlier, boost it on Facebook, reshare it on Twitter and, and uh, Instagram. And that's the kind of thing that seeds viral activity. So mm -hmm. what you want to do is you really want to amplify content that suddenly sees high engagement so you can increase the chances of it going viral. That's great. That's, that's really important advice for everybody here. All right. Well, I hope that's helpful. I think you've drained everything I know about uh paid content um we've, we've run them dry happy to, happy to field any more questions from the audience or from yourself janet and jed why don't you um tell people where they can find you and how to connect with you well right now the best way to connect with me or to find me is to go and i'll post a link in the room post a link here um that is the Entrepreneur Summit in Dallas. It's happening on March 24th. And I am going to be there with a number of other really amazing folks, including the aforementioned Joel Com. Um, and for content marketers, Ann Handley is going to be there of mm -hmm. Marketing Profs. So um, the three of us and, and several other folks are going to be speaking at the Entrepreneur Summit. We're going to be talking about how to grow your business. Um, it's going to be all types of topics from uh, entrepreneurship to marketing to uh, to growth hacking. And uh, it's going to be a great event. You'll get a chance to meet us all in person and hang out with us, have lunch with us, um, get to ask us questions individually and meet us in person. So now is the time to go hit that up and get a ticket. I think it's like... Uh, I don't know how much it is, but it's less than 150 bucks. Super cheap. That sounds like a really great event. And, and it's a, it's a one day conference. Um, and I'll be there for three or four days in Dallas. So if you live in the area, now is the time to hook me up, go to the conference and we'll meet up afterwards. Um, tickets. I've been checking tickets to fly into Dallas are super cheap. I've seen mm. tickets from all over the country to get to Dallas in the range of 150 to 200 bucks. Um, and there's a, a deal on that website there where you can get an overnight hotel for really cheap too. So I really encourage you take a day out of your schedule um, and come on down and visit us and pick up a whole bunch of great information um, and get to say hi to me and, and Ann and Joel and many others in person. It'll be a lot of fun. That sounds like a really great event. I saw the website before the blab and, and, the people that are coming are, are definitely stellar and the opportunity to be able to talk to you guys in person instead of you do your little talk and you go behind the stage and we never see you again. I much prefer this format. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, this is this is one of the formats where, where the speakers are out and hanging out throughout the entire event. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And Han Hanley, if you're interested in content marketing, this is a woman who wrote the book on content marketing. So She's the girl. Um, so this is a place to come if you uh, have any interest at all in, in content marketing. So it'd be a lot of fun. Gail, yeah. thank you for joining us. <laughs>
Thanks, Gail. And, and thank you, Jed. This is really fun. And there's a lot of information here. I hope that people are going to go back and watch it again because there's a ton of stuff that people can use here. And I really appreciate you coming on the show. Oh, that's great. I hope so. I hope it is useful.